Uh, welcome everyone to Coast Talks. Uh, my name is David Fissel. I'm co-founder of ASL Environmental Sciences of uh, Sandishton, BC, and also a member of the Interim Board of Directors of Coast. I am opening today's event from the territories of La the Lekwungen peoples, today known as the Esquimalt and Songhees nations, as well as the territories of the Waysanich peoples, including the Sartlip, uh, Pakwachin, Sayut, and Saikam, and Malahat nations. Coast is committed to working with First Nations and to respecting their long-standing relationships to lands and waters, as well as their leadership as innovators and stewards of these territories. I invite everyone joining today to take a moment to reflect on the territory from which you are joining today's conversation. For those new to Coast Talks, Coast stands for the Center for Ocean Applied Sustainable Technologies, which is a new ocean innovation hub based in Victoria, BC. Coast's mission is to drive inclusive prosperity in British Columbia's sustainable blue economy through entrepreneurship, innovation, and expansive partnerships. As a member of the Interim Coast Board, we launched the Coast Talk series to showcase some of the organizations, innovators, and companies working hard to build a sustainable ocean future. Today's talk is one of six. You can sign up for upcoming talks on our website, canadacoast.ca, and view past talks on YouTube. Today, I'm delighted to kick off our conversation about ocean renewable energy, moderated by Elisa, Elisa Oberman, Executive Director of Marine Renewables Canada. And other presenters include John Wright of Northland Power and Riley Richardson of the University of Victoria. So let me introduce Elisa Oberman, who is the Executive Director of Marine Renewables Canada. That's an association that works to align industry, academia, and government to ensure that Canada is a leader in providing marine renewable energy solutions to a world market. Since 2012, Elisa has worked to facilitate technology innovation in the sector by advocating for supportive policies, identifying international business develop opportunities, and enhancing the ca capacity of the local supply chain. Elisa has also designed and led numerous engagement and outreach activities to grow knowledge and support for marine renewable energy development. Elisa, over to you. Thanks very much, David, for that introduction. Uh, and I also just want to thank Coast very much for inviting me to moderate. And uh, in particular, just having this be the topic of uh, one of the Coast talks. Obviously, it's a, a subject that we are very interested in. Um, and the other thing I would mention is that Marine Renewables Canada actually has its roots in uh, British Columbia. We were founded here in 2004. Um, I'm based in Halifax, but it's just exciting to be able to be kind of around that audience and hope to be there in person at some point as well. Um, so today we're going to be talking about marine renewable energy and then the role it plays in the blue economy. Um, and energy from waves, tides, offshore wind and river currents really have a lot of potential for British Columbia, but also Canada as a whole. Um, I would say that they're really uniquely positioned to help achieve two of Canada's key priorities that we hear about all the time. One being building the blue economy and the other being fighting climate change. And there's not many sectors that really have that opportunity to do both. Um, and I think that's where we're seeing that there's a lot of potential to, to move forward. So that's what we're going to we're going to dig into today with our other panelists. Um, basically, the, the format for today is you're going to hear a bit from all of us. Um, you'll have the opportunity as the audience to ask uh, to do Q&A through the, the question and answer function um, or chat if, if you more comfortable with that and I'll do my best to kind of go through and, and moderate um, and ask questions to our other panelists as I go along. But to kick us off, I thought maybe I would provide just a few slides to provide some context uh, for this session. 
So I'm just sharing my screen here. Hopefully everybody can see it okay. Um, but first, I mean, with those that aren't that familiar with marine renewable energy, it's kind of a question of, you know, why, why are we even focused on it? There's a lot of other renewable energy resources. There's a lot of other ocean technologies that have, you know, potential are more mature. Um, and these are kind of the four buckets that I would say are really key to why marine renewable energy is, is unique and also has a lot of potential for Canada. One being obviously it's a, you know, it's a clean energy, it's renewable, um, and it can contribute to our climate action goals and objectives. The other is that although it has different assets and, um, you know, unique aspects to it compared to other uh, renewables, one of the things that's very interesting about, especially when you, when you look at, for example, offshore wind, wave, um, tidal, and, and river current, is there's more, there's a lot of predictability and if they're also all highly forecastable. So when we're trying to bring on other renewable energy resources like solar uh, and wind that might have you know, some variability, these can actually act as a really good backup and, and help to integrate more renewables into our energy system or electricity system, I should say. The other interesting thing is that there's a lot of marine renewable energy resources around remote um, and coastal and rural uh, communities. So there's a lot of potential to develop those resources. Um, and there's some areas where there may, they may be a stronger resource than um, say other types of renewables. And so there's, there's potential there to really look at how um, there may be a clean electricity benefit, but also an economic uh, development benefit um, and create some self-sufficiency for communities. And then finally, you know, a big piece, and we're going to be talking more about blue economy today, is the economic potential of developing the resource. Uh, one thing we're finding in Marine Renewables Canada is we have a lot of members that have worked in offshore oil and gas and other marine industries um, that are now finding opportunities in offshore wind, not, you know, not necessarily in Canada, but globally, the offshore wind sector is blue, and you'll hear more from John on that. Um, and also in, in tidal, uh, particularly in Nova Scotia, where there's quite a bit of activity happening. So to give you an idea of what that activity actually looks like across Canada, um, this is just a snapshot of some of the, you know, the key projects um, and initiatives underway across the country. And as you can see, there's, you know, there's activity in all um, four forms, I guess I'll say, of, of marine renewables that we're focused on. Um, in tidal energy, obviously, there's a lot of activity in Nova Scotia and the Bay of Fundy. Um, there's activity also even in provinces you wouldn't think are necessarily marine renewables, but where there's a good river current resource. Um, and so basically, you know, that's to say that across Canada, every province, even if they're not on a, a, on a coast, has some kind of potential in marine renewables when you take into account river current energy, which is a very similar technology to tidal energy. And then when we come to British Columbia, you can see there's um, activity and initiatives underway in, in offshore wind, tidal, uh, and wave as well. And we're gonna get in more into that um, with our other speakers. So this is the slide I really kind of wanted to focus on to get people thinking about, you know, uh, creatively about how we can actually use marine renewable energy. Um, and obviously, you know, the key thing is it's a, it's a renewable electricity resource um, and there's the ability to, de to develop it for utility scale and grid connected power. Um, but there's also a lot of other segments and, and uh, sectors that it can be developed for. So I mentioned remote uh, and isolated communities. Um, there's also a lot of potential, and you, you may have been seeing more about this in the media, about offshore wind production for green hydrogen. Um, desalination is, uh, we have actually a member that's using wave power for that. Um, disaster recovery and resiliency ocean observation and marine robotics, um, offshore oil and gas is one actually that our members have been focusing on a bit. Um, and we've been seeing in Europe, uh, uh, offshore wind powering offshore oil and gas platforms to help them decarbonize their sector um, and aquaculture. And that's another one that is, there's a lot of opportunity for that in British Columbia as well. So there's a lot of these opportunities that are off grid markets uh, where marine renewables can, can partner with other ocean industries uh, to help them meet their net zero goals. So we're going to be hearing more about, uh, you know, more specifics from some of our, our next speakers that are here with me today. Um, and so first, I would like to introduce John Wright. Uh, he is the Executive Director of Business Development with Northland Power, uh, which is a Canada-based clean and renewable energy company. Uh, his role, Northland Power, has focused on grid scale uh, energy storage development and also supporting Northland Power's offshore wind development interests in Canada and the United States. So I will pass it over to John. 
Uh, thanks, Elisa, and I I have uh, some slides to present, um, and so I just will start to share that screen now. Okay, um, sorry, everybody can see the screen okay? Okay, um, so just a, a quick background uh, on Northland Power. And what I wanna do is, is just give you a little bit of a sense of who we are as a, as a Canadian company. Um, and also then paint a picture of kind of what the offshore uh, world is looking like and, and, and the future of it as far as growth opportunities. And then talk uh, a little bit more about the potential in Canada as we see it, and uh, some thoughts about how how we get there. So um, just a, a quick uh, minute on, on Northland Power. Uh, it, it's a Canadian company, uh, originally founded out of Ontario uh, some 30 years ago, and it's focused on uh, clean energy and and renewable. Uh, we have onshore uh, renewable assets, wind farms, uh, solar farms across Canada and uh, Europe and in the US. And uh, we have in the last 10 years become one of the uh, major global players, uh, fourth in the world actually, in the um, development, ownership and operating of offshore wind. Uh, we're quite proud of that. Um, I think we're, the, we're the, actually the only company in Canada that is uh, developing, operating and only uh, offshore wind assets. Uh, we're traded on the TSX and have a market capitalization of about $9 billion. And we have about $15 billion in, in assets in, in operation. Um, so uh, that's kind of what we're about. Uh, let me kind of paint a picture of the uh, global market. This is from a presentation I actually did with uh, MRC, uh, uh, pulling some information that uh, IRENA, the International Renewable Energy uh, Association, ha had pulled together from their research. Uh, even though it's referring to 2019, I think it's quite relevant. In fact, uh, if, if anything, things are if accelerated, accelerated beyond these original forecasts. Um, but what you see here is in the U.S., and this is on the U.S. Northeast Coast, a pretty significant commitment to offshore wind to the tune of uh, 22 uh, and a half uh, gigawatts, which is which is a lot of power. Um, and that's really kind of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, when you look at the forecast to be uh, nearly uh, a terawatt um, by 2050. And that's driven by uh, many, many countries uh, looking to their ocean resources to help drive their their de, uh, decarbonization. So it's it's a it's a pretty significant opportunity uh, uh, globally, and that's why uh, Northland has a has a huge uh, focus in that market. Um, this is just a slide kind of showing. Uh, the, the portfolio of activity just to give you some sense of scale of, of what we're working on. Um, we have um, we have um, projects operating in the North Sea in Europe, uh, some soon to be operating uh, in, in Asia Pacific. And you know all, all told uh, between operating, early uh, stage development and late stage development are under construction. Uh, you know, we're well into the, the uh, 15,000 megawatt range. So, uh, and uh, we see much more opportunity uh, uh, beyond that. Uh, turning our picture to Canada is, um, you know, Northland has to date invested uh, uh, billions of dollars in offshore wind overseas. Um, that's capital flowing from a Canadian company uh, to other jurisdictions uh, globally. And uh, we see uh, uh, some significant potential for offshore wind in Canada and would certainly like to, to uh, deploy capital uh, here in our, in our home country. 
Um, this is a, a slide um, uh, Elise and I worked together to kind of help paint a picture of the key elements that have to come together in order for offshore wind to, to actually become a reality in Canada. Other jurisdictions have, have uh, undertaken a lot of work in these areas to enable offshore wind. Uh, Canada is, is um, sort of at early stage uh, as far as um, uh, the ingredients coming together, but we see uh, a lot of uh, activity and interests uh, for, from government and um, associations and so on uh, looking at how to develop this. I'm just going to elaborate a little bit on what uh, these sort of four pillars, the socioeconomic policy framework, technology and supply chain logistics, and physical environment that all have to come together uh, in order for offshore wind to, to happen. Um, just looking at the, the social economic, which is the light blue boxes, is uh, uh, there's um, we call social license. So, you know, will the public, Will the coastal communities, will the will the other users of the ocean resources uh, accept offshore wind to occur? Um, and that's not just um, uh, that. Also, is is in respect uh, respecting uh, coastal uh, First Nations uh, communities as well. And there's a lot of engagement and education that needs to happen for that. Uh, obviously, a key driver is there needs to be a market for power. And uh, that's where there's been some really interesting shifts. Uh, a lot of, uh, initially, I think offshore wind was look, being looked at strictly for a domestic supply of electricity. Uh, but what we're seeing in Europe and North as part of a large consortium is the, uh, you know, uh, I don't think a week goes by where, where there's not a lot of discussion of the future of hydrogen and hydrogen production. and. Um, there's uh, some projects uh, in the North Sea uh, that's looking at utilizing the uh, additional capacity available from offshore wind to start to uh, evolve into to hydrogen production and, uh, and um, sort of overlapping with the policy side of things is in, in BC, uh, there's the new hydrogen strategy uh, that has recently come out uh, that presents a, kind of a dual avenue for, uh, for the market for power. One is as a as feedstock to hydrogen production and the other is, is obviously domestic electricity supply. And uh, with the deepening of electrification, uh, electric vehicles and uh, electric energy consumption, uh, we think that there's going to be significant growth in demand uh, beyond simply replacing carbon-based technologies. Um, but the bottom line is there needs to be sustainable economics in terms of the cost of, of building these things and, and a price that, uh, that can support the cost of, of building. Um, there's the importance of having uh, interconnections to provide the power, uh, some kinds of procurement investment frameworks, uh, the ability to locate right now in Canada, um, there's sort of, uh, you're working with the provincial governments and federal governments on um, trying to establish where you can actually uh, locate, uh, have the right to locate uh, on the ocean floor for these kinds of projects. And then you've got the whole uh, regular regulatory regime. Uh, it's, you know, offshore wind, uh, just like tidal and, and wave kind of brings new thinking to the agencies that may have not cope with or dealt with these technologies before, uh, Department of Fisheries and, and other um, uh, jurisdictional factors with interest in the ocean. Um, under sort of the technology supply chain uh, side of things, uh, for offshore wind to work, you need uh, port access to fairly substantial ports for laydown and staging. Uh, supply chain is something that um, we think that uh, it's going to evolve right now. Uh, many of the components were being produced in Europe, uh, which is why uh, offshore wind became so uh, economic and, and became a sort of mainstay for power in, in, the, uh, in the European theater. Um, in, in the Canadian context, uh, one of our challenges is, is that we'd have to bring a lot of components 
uh, from abroad in order to, to build the facilities here. But with the Northeast US, um, uh, looking at uh, such a large commitment to offshore, uh, um, offshore wind, it's going to create an opportunity for uh, actually manufacturing to be established in North America. And on the BC side of, the, of things is that the Asia Pacific is extremely active with offshore wind development. And ideally there'd be some uh, capacity for components, but uh, obviously we'd like to see um, a strengthening of the, the uh, local supply chain and capacity here in Canada. Uh, the technology itself, I'm referring to the turbines, uh, they're getting uh, becoming more uh, efficient and uh, higher capacity over time, starting in, getting, evolving into the 15 megawatt range. It's a lot of power from a single uh, turbine. Uh, the last sort of list of things that uh, are, are here is um, there's a lot of jurisdictions have already completed these kinds of studies to enable offshore wind. So they've looked at the ocean conditions, depth, current, wave, They've done the geotechnical work on the sea bottom so that um, developers such as ourselves can already uh, pre-plan the foundation types. They've got a really good wind resource data over a long period of time, which uh, helps forecasting and predictability. Um, what's interesting is, you know, when you look at the Canadian waters um, and in some of our wind analysis that we've done or that we've seen, uh, there's been studies in, in Atlantic Canada as well is uh, Canada has a, a prospect of actually a higher uh, wind capacity factor than the uh, North Sea, um, which, which uh, it's the high capacity factor that helps uh, the tipping point for the economics for offshore wind. And, and here in our own home country, on both coasts, we have uh, very significant uh, wind resources comparatively. I, it's again, it's looking at underwater infrastructure. There's no, so there's no conflicts there. Ecological characteristics with marine life, the mammals and the interface with other uses such as uh, uh, fishing, shipping and so on. So, you know, it, it looks uh, complicated in terms of all the things that need to align. Um, but other jurisdictions have uh, proven that they're, they've been able to do it. And, uh, and are seeing the benefits from achieving their uh, decarbonization goals. So I think I'll leave it at that, Elisa, and uh, then we can save more time for questions. Great, thanks so much, John. And yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with you. I think that like, it can seem like there's just so much to do. Um, we have to remember we've done a lot of that work for tidal energy already. They did it for offshore oil and gas. Um, and we, when we look at what our goals are going to be, you know, leading up to 2050, these are the kinds of things that we need to start doing now. So that's just my little pitch. Um, <laughs> they're going to keep working on it. Um, so next, uh, the other thing I would say is to all attendees, feel free to type in any questions as we go along. Um, I won't get to them to the end, but it just if it's top of mind and you're hearing something, feel free to, to type it in. Um, so now our next speaker, I'm going to go over to Riley Richardson. Um, he is research scientist at the University of Victoria's Pacific Regional Institute for Marine Energy Discovery, or PRIMED. And PRIMED focuses on eliminating uncertainty and risk uh, that are barriers to first-of-a-kind community-based marine renewable energy projects. And I won't say more about it because I'm sure Riley's going to talk more about it as well. So over to you, Riley. Thanks so much, Elisa. I'll just share my screen here. Yeah, so as mentioned, I'm Riley, uh, research scientist at PRIMED. And a little overview, um, we're a research lab at the University of Victoria based out of the Institute for Integrated Energy Systems. And our affiliate labs, um, both the West Coast Wave Initiative and SSDL, are mostly student-led research. And so academic kind of curiosity-driven projects, whereas PRIMED is different in that we're focused on client-driven research. So we're focused on enabling marine renewable energy development on the BC coast. And to do this, we provide a range of services from resource characterization and modeling, cost analyses, field monitoring, and more. So an overview of some of the drivers for marine renewable energy and specifically wave development in BC. The biggest is probably clean BC initiatives. So getting to uh, electrify industry and transportation are key aspects in BC to meet Paris targets. 
And then another prominent driver in a short-term market for wave energy is achieving diesel reductions and transitioning to geographically available renewables in remote off-grid communities. Finally, as the province grows, especially on the south coast, there's a need to meet increased energy demand um, within the next 20 years, and wave energy allows for the development of generation assets near BC's largest population centers, rather than historically where we have um, our large power infrastructure hundreds of kilometers away on, on the Peace and Columbia rivers. Um, so despite the, the drive for wave energy, there are many obstacles impeding the development of it, as it is still in its early stages as an industry. And a critical need among them is characterizing the resource and identifying opportunities. So some of the work at Primed, we started our modeling in 2007 using the SWAN model. So version three was our first operational version, and it only covered the, the southern portion of Vancouver Island. Version and four expanded around Vancouver Island and up the central coast. And then version five is what you can see on this slide. The latest version we have, we're incorporating tidal currents. So continually and iteratively um, advancing these models. And there's a range of inputs from sea state conditions that are fed in along the, these boundary conditions from global wave models um, to more localized buoy data, giving us information on winds and uh, waves as they happen. And then there's different classes of resource assessments to achieve based on the stage of assessment. And each of these has their own resolution, both temporally and spatially, with increased resolution moving from this class one to class three. Um, and within our SWAN model, we have pretty much a class one resolution on, in the offshore areas. And as you get closer to the coast, resolution increases to class two, and then class three for localized specific modeling. Now, well, kind of land-based renewable energy potential and resource characterization have been undertaken extensively in BC. And these are considered in future energy planning by BC Hydro. It's a much different story for wave energy. So we have some work funded by BC Hydro that aims to remedy this by identifying synergies between resource availability, minimizing inf infringement on existing uses using marine spatial planning, and assessing local demand both for grid and rem remote community applications to identify strategically important wave sites. Our primary focus right now, though, is on small-scale wave energy development in BC, specifically for remote off-grid communities that are reliant on diesel. And this is order to achieve community energy ambitions and to scale up the industry through the development of supply chains, collecting data on costs and device longevity, simplifying regulatory frameworks, environmental monitoring, and more. So a current project we're working on is with the Malaychit Muchalat First Nation and their traditional village of Yukwad on Nitka Island. So it's a, it's a national historic site, and it's actually the first, the location for the first site of contact between Captain Cook and First Nations on the West Coast. However, by the 1950s, most of the population had moved to larger uh, population centers with the promise of jobs and services, and currently only two community members live there year round. But the MMFN have aspirations to develop UQAT in order to go home, which will require electricity to facilitate a modern revitalization of the community, and wave energy was identified by the nation as a promising electricity source. So we're currently working with the MMFN, Barclay Project Group, EDI, and InGen on a front-end engineering and design study in order to assess this project's feasibility and to plan for the future deployment of a wave device. You can see kind of the six primary goals of the study outlined here um, that I'll touch on on the next few slides. So the wave energy converter being considered is a 50 kilowatt floating point absorber developed by InGen Inc., which is a South Korean wave company. And it has advantages as the actual power generation isn't occurring um, within the, the water column. Power is basically transferred through these mechanical cables to the power takeoff onshore. And that was a big thing for the nation to kind of keep the energy generation outside of the sea. Um, but there are limitations, primarily operational depth and short of proximity in order to reduce the loss of energy transmission along these cables. Oh. So some of the work we've been doing lately is we deployed two buoys, both from BC companies, Access Technologies and Marine Labs, 
And this is ordered to collect wave data over the next year to validate and refine our local wave model. So we have one in this near shore area, which is the site area of interest, and a second one that's been deployed further offshore to gain a broader understanding of the sea state at the site. And then we're also undertaking bathymetry surveys with the help of EDI and Terra Remote, and again, both BC companies, to, to assess site suitability and to inform the modeling to meet the, the class three IEC standards for the wave model. Further to that, we're doing comprehensive design modeling, um, especially using DSA Ocean, again, another BC company, uh, their Protus D model. And this allows us to model the mooring lines as well as engines power takeoff. We're also gonna undertake an economic analysis to provide the MMFN with a second opinion on project costs. Um, that's a critical consideration for wave energy projects and marine renewables at this time. And then also a microgrid and hybrid renewable energy system model to determine how do you balance the load and demand in this small grid, make decisions for the system, when to send power to the end user or to store in a battery um, as well as managing additional renewable energy inputs such as solar. So we've also built a, a test facility to research battery systems and inform the storage components of the microgrid modeling. Um, the final component of the feed study is gonna be a regulatory and permitting workshop. And despite kind of the available documents, the Clean Energy BC guidebook um, and a guide on ocean uh, energy, the regulation and permitting for marine renewable energy in BC is not entirely clear. Um, so to overcome this, we're going to hold a workshop to bring together project partners and pertinent regulators to help guide the MMF, MMFN through the permitting process, align the project with multiple levels of government priorities, and to build upon these existing uh, regulatory frameworks to guide future marine renewable energy developments in BC while also advancing this current project. Um, and so I think the, the main takeaway beyond the work that Primed is doing is just even at this early stage um, where wave energy is focused on smaller scale projects, specifically remote off-grid communities, there are a multitude of BC companies involved in developing wave energy at this stage. And the development of the industry will be incremental and iterative, and it's gonna require collaboration between academia, government, and the private sector to establish supply chains and necessary marine services in BC to support the, uh, the industry ahead of what I hope will be kind of commercial scale applications and actual grid integration within the next decade. Um, yeah, and that's it, thank you. Thanks very much, Riley. Um, and one thing I would also point out, I, I, we didn't talk much about global, like what's happening globally in the marine renewable energy sector. Um, that could have been something I covered, but I, I would mention the focus that um, Primed and, and Riley talked about looking at small scale. Um, I mean, that's been an area in Canada that we've been um, thinking that there's, you know, there's a lot of potential there to develop technologies and 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 R and D and and services that then can be exported to a global market because there are many small scale opportunities like you saw in that um, diagram that I put together uh, at the intro. So we're going to move into uh, Q&A, and I see that there's been uh, a few questions that have come through. So I'm going to go to those first, um, and then we'll, I just encourage uh, attendees to, to feel free because we want this to be a really kind of open discussion, and, and hopefully we can answer some of the things that you're really curious about when it comes to marine renewable energy. Um, so the first one is for John. Um, can you provide an update on Hefgate Strait? Uh, have you thoughts about floating wind for West Coast Vancouver Island and Haida Gwaii? Long-term, but should it be on the list? Uh, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, so uh, it would have shown on the map that I provided of Northland's uh, sort of global uh, activity. And uh, we did acquire um, an older um, offshore wind development had been in in the works for some time uh, last year. And uh, we, we are in essence kind of hitting the restart button with that, um, going through all of our own uh, feasibility work, um, uh, you know, apply, going through the application for investigative use licensing and so on. Um, we wanna do a lot more kind of background research before we um, sort of kick off our, 
public engagement. And of course, um, it'll be uh, very important with us to, to uh, be able to establish a um, uh, trusting and, and positive relationship with uh, First Nations as a, as a precursor to uh, any project like this uh, advancing. Um, some of the characteristics in the Hecate Strait is that it's shallow. Um, so there wouldn't be a, a need for um, uh, floating offshore wind. Uh, we're talking depths of, of uh, as little as uh, 20 meters in some cases. Uh, just to give by way of an example in the North Sea, um, the average depth is about 30 meters and um, sort of the, the monopile uh, fixed based uh, offshore wind turbines can be built uh, cost effectively in up to about 50 meters of water. Beyond that, you're starting to get into the floating range. Uh, Northland is keeping a close eye on the floating technology. It's not quite the same capacity and it's not as uh, mature of a, of a technology uh, to, to kind of have the comparable economics with uh, fixed um, offshore wind. Um, that's um, that's on the BC side. In California, where the water is deeper, they're actually they're not even considering fixed. It's strictly uh, going to be floating uh, technology. So we're keeping a close eye on how things are evolving there. And as of course, as you start to use up all of the uh, uh, what we call the fixed um, offshore wind turbine areas in the seabed, then there's going to be a natural evolution to to floating. So. Um, and then on the Atlantic uh, Canada side, um, there, are, there have started to be some studies looking at uh, areas where it could be uh, fixed uh, turbines. And um, it looks like there could be some, some good potential there that kind of pair up with the wind resources. So uh, stay tuned on that front. Elisa did mention a floating uh, pilot uh, project that's being proposed on Atlantic Canada as well. And we're gonna be watching the uh, the results of that. Um, but right now, um, Northland's focus is on the most proven technologies that we can uh, economically deploy uh, so that we can meet that uh, criteria that I mentioned earlier, which is being able to provide, the, to respond to the market uh, need for power at a price that is uh, cost effective. Thanks, John. Uh, we get, we're getting a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to hop over to Riley next. This one is for you. Um, when do you expect the engine's point absorber device to be deployed, and are there any other wave devices expected to hit the water in the next year or two? Um, not within the next year. So the feed study will be wrapping up probably next March, um, and then from there, MMFN will make a decision will, whether to go forward um, to do a, a few further applications with NRCAN to actually deploy the device. So I'd say a device would be deployed in two years if the feed study shows that it is promising. Um, other applications in terms of developments, there's a few in the pipeline that we're working on, but we got to do a bit more discussions with communities, get funding before we start to, to deploy devices. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question for John. Uh, considering that Northland Power was established three decades ago here in Canada, why is that Northland activity is more noticeable outside of Canada? For example, more offshore wind projects in the North Sea. Uh, that, that is a, uh, a good question, fair and reasonable. And it's just the dynamics of, of business. Um, capital and business flows to where uh, the opportunities exist. And uh, so in the case of uh, Europe, European offshore wind, uh, they were, um, they needed the power. Uh, they were kind of landlocked for having the scale of power that they needed. And so they created a tariff regime uh, that uh, could support the, uh, the economics and the investment um, and returns that are needed for uh, the, you're talking billion dollar projects. So you have to know that there's a, a demand and market for power and that uh, you're going to get a reasonable price uh, for the electricity based on your investment. Uh, in Canada, in the Canadian context, and so <laughs> Northland hasn't been doing offshore wind for 30 years. That's been more so the last decade. Uh, a lot of our onshore our projects, onshore wind and uh, solar and so forth, 
uh, biomass in our very earliest days where it's the same driver. Uh, is there a market for power that, um, that warrants the, the investment of capital? Yeah, and I, that's a, another thing I'll mention too, is that we've been really closely monitoring um, what the, what's going on in the United States with offshore wind. Um, and I think in terms of suppliers in Canada, that, that's where they're also starting to see some opportunity and get some experience. Um, so one would hope that you know, we'll see development here in, in Canada at some point, um, hopefully in the more sooner rather than later. Um, but it, like John said, it definitely comes down to where the markets are. Um, and I think with Canada being such a you know, resource rich country, um, we see a lot of focus on more, more mature renewables right now. But I think as I've probably said a couple times now, you know, when we're looking at increased electrification and um, just trying to meet these net zero goals, not just for the electricity sector, but just as for many sectors, there's much more opportunity um, there as well. And there's two so, two factors. There's two factors starting in, in on the Canadian <laughs> front. Uh, Riley alluded to the increased electrification for transport, and that's on land and sea vessels. Um, but the other thing too is I've I've sat in on uh, webinars and on panels federally, and a lot of other countries are looking at Canada for and uh, uh, our, our our kind of renewable resources as as kind of prime spot for hydrogen production for global supply. And I think that that's gonna be a significant opportunity that could create the market for this, uh, this scale. Um, uh, for offshore wind, you, you certainly need a scale to make the economics work. And uh, I know that there's a lot of people paying attention to the growth in the hydrogen uh, production and the renewable opportunity as the uh, as the feedstock for that energy and, and Canada has become kind of a uh, noted for its uh, significant capacity for renewable uh, green energy to produce green hydrogen. This is this is a bit of an add-on question to what we're you know the topic we're discussing right now. Um, that came in, which is, is uh, John, you might be able to answer this one. Kind of, I think it would be opinion based, but is the expansion of hydropower in BC a potential hold back for offshore wind energy? Uh, it, you know what? It'll, Crazy. It, you know, it's a good question. At the end of the day, uh, from our experience, is it's going to be the the economics of the product. Um, you know, um, hydropower expansion beyond site C in, in BC. Uh, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball knowing what the future of that looks like. Um, but at the end of the day, it'll be what is the cost of the electricity coming out uh, from future new hydro facilities uh, versus what can be done with offshore, offshore wind. Okay, now I'm gonna move over to Riley. Um, so the question is here at ONC, we've installed coastal ocean dynamics application. Uh, CODAR, I don't know if that's the acronym and how to ever pronounce it, but we're going with that. Uh, high frequency, so HF radar for producing more accurate surface current estimates. I was wondering if you might be aware of that and if it, that free data can be of any use to your project. Um, I was not aware of that, and yeah, it, it could be useful. Right now, we use some tidal measurements from the National Research Council of Canada. Um, it's called the Telemac Tidal Model, um, as well as a few deployments of ACDPs up the coast. But yeah, we're, we're always looking for more data, so that would be great. I think I've lost everybody. Unfortunately. Still here. Still here. Yeah, I did I, was it me that lost you guys? I think so. I don't know. I thought yeah, I was frozen there. Yeah, we're still here. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Um, okay, so I, I had a, another question I wanted to ask Riley. Um, and you kind of touched on it, um, you know, just talking about what's needed in British Columbia to see more wave energy development. Um, and so 
my question is, what do you think in terms of policy supports that are needed that could help facilitate more wave energy development, but marine renewables in general? I mean, I know there's probably a, you know, a laundry list of things you'd like to see, but like just so a few priority policies that would be very helpful. I think the funding is starting to come around, which has been a pretty huge deficit over the past decade, um, both from federal sources, um, but just kind of determining what the regulatory framework looks like and how we're going to permit these devices. It seems like both at the provincial and federal level, we're a bit too risk adverse um, in BC, especially for single device deployments. So in going back to that regulatory workshop, kind of determining with uh, Flinro and DFO where their responsibilities lie and how we get passed back and forth between those two organizations, because they both seem to say, no, you go to DFO and DFO will go, no, that's not our jurisdiction. We'll send you back to Flinro. Um, so refining kind of the permitting and regulatory process in the clean energy guidebook and the ocean energy policy. So that's something we're hoping to do through the MMFN project, but also just with iterative research from Primed over the next few years or so. Yeah, and I, just from seeing what's happening, not just in BC, but uh, across the country and other areas where marine renewables is being developed, I think one of the challenges we've been seeing is that a lot of the legislation that's currently in place that, you know, that has some kind of impact on the sector is not yet at a phase where it's looking capable of really regulating emerging technologies. So it's not flexible enough. And that I would say is one thing we'd really like to see, I, I think would help um, if there's more flexibility for clean technologies that are coming to market, because I think it would probably help quite a bit um, in, re in reducing some barriers. Yeah, and even tailoring kind of the, the process to the needs of a developer and a proponent um, for the baseline data they need to collect to do site assessments. It's the way the investigative license of occupations are set up right now. I don't think it's conducive to getting that baseline data where you can even start to begin to make decisions on projects. Um, so hopefully that will be something that kind of gets developed over time. Yeah. Agreed. It's, it's, oh. it's, abs it's absolutely critical um, because, uh, you know, a lot of these projects, uh, they'll even, you could have for a large scale offshore wind project could straddle what would be traditionally seen as provincial waters and federal waters. And, um, you know, if you want, if you want to um, uh, steer capital away <laughs> from investing in your country, make it really difficult to uh to to get through these processes because again in in the north sea the governments did all the work they got the policies aligned and it was really clear uh what you're going to get into we weren't stepping in any, any jurisdictional um back and forth or or battlegrounds tug of wars um and so you can focus on these projects are big, costly, and complex, and you can't <laughs> have losses in schedule because of these kinds of things. So, and I know, uh, you know, Elisa's doing a lot of work. She's <laughs> talking to people very provincially and, and federally. We're, we're kind of hopeful, uh, again, sort of alluding to the hydrogen side of things, but, you know, there was a lot of good work that was done on, on sort of the offshore oil and gas, and maybe some lessons that can be learned there rather than reinventing the wheel. Um, that could be applied to these these kinds of uh, so Lisa, maybe you have a little more insight on what that might look like. Yeah, I mean, I think we, I mean, we've been in discussions at least in Nova Scotia about that, um, and I think there are definitely a lot of synergies. So we see, you know, synergies with offshore oil and gas, not just from the regulatory side, but then also with suppliers and and a lot of the, the research, like some of the data that's already out there can be used as well. So I do think there's ways to kind of expedite or at least tap into some of that that will be helpful. Um, and I hope to see some of those discussions and, and that kind of work evolve for sure. Um, this is just one a question that came in and I, I'm gonna kind of expand on it, but I'll, I'll provide this first part, which is it's Focus kind of on supply chain, I would say most mostly. Um, so, how do you see work being moved forward in terms of onshore facilities and vessels and support personnel to support offshore renewables? So, I guess my kind of broader question, because uh, I think this is it's hitting on this, is you know what are the opportunities for businesses and organizations now to get involved in marine renewable energy? So, if you're a business in British Columbia or a research organization. 
Um, you know, what are the kinds of things they could focus on and how do you see that maybe evolving to future opportunities? And that could be a question for either of you. Um, maybe I can lead off, but uh, at least I think uh, MRC had, uh, had conducted a study looking at um, what elements of the supply chain or, you know, whether it be tidal or, or um, offshore wind, what, what in the current global context, like obviously some of the big offshore wind uh, turbine components would come from overseas, but there are a number of, and I can say from, from Northland's perspective, when we're looking at uh, building up the cost frameworks for these kinds of projects, we obviously look at what kind of things can be sourced uh, locally, uh, you know, related to perhaps uh, electronics uh, substations, uh, uh, the cabling itself. Um, you know, we, we'd look forward to the day where there's some domestic uh, capacity for perhaps turbine manufacture and the, and the blades and the, those sorts of things. But you know, there there are there are a lot of components, and um, and maybe that's something that people. Uh, again, at least I know that um, that's something that MRC took a look at, and that's not a, uh, I think it was a good study and it was a pretty good guide to say, look, in the current current context, here's here's where the supply chain should be thinking, focus, focusing its efforts and also um, uh, speaking to government and, and supporting the development of these opportunities. Yeah, just to add to that too, like I, we had done a study or not MRC, but there had been a study done and a, a few of them actually that had shown that um, with, at least with the tidal energy industry, about 60 to 70% of the project components and, and um, life cycle inputs would be could be completed or, or satisfied with local uh, suppliers and, and services and, and um, whatnot. So there is, and I think that's pretty transferable in a lot of ways to offshore wind as well. Uh, and just an example from Nova Scotia, what we've seen where there is, you know, growing and, and progressing tidal projects um, is that there's a, a lot of local suppliers involved. And once they, they kind of took that first step to get involved um, early and kind of took maybe a little bit of risk on and getting involved in a new sector, they've now been seeing more work here and also internationally as well. So there's definitely an opportunity there for sure. Um, Riley, uh, I don't know if you had something to add. I may have cut you off. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, just to add to that, in terms of with the Moatra Michelet project, we've already started reaching out to companies when we come up. We need to do a bathymetry survey. Do we have the internal capabilities? Let's reach out to companies, see what they can do, geotechnical um, assessments of the seafloor, vessel capabilities. Like these are all things that are going to start snowballing, especially even for such a small project for the amount of BC companies we have involved. And a lot of that has just been reaching out or cold calling and then figuring out, yeah, there is synergies between us and the industry and they can provide um, these really necessary initial components. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to continue to build. And I'm hoping that BC's kind of own internal capability to provide these services will grow as well. There's one question here that kind of, uh, I know we're close to time here, but this just is, this might be quick. I think it's kind of just an add on uh, or expands on what we were just talking about. And it's just generally like, you know, as the industry grows, do you think that there are enough people that are appropriately trained uh, metal fabricators in place that are to, like can support future device deployments? Or do you think there's going to be or is already supply chain uh, gaps? Well, I guess one of the things, uh, Lisa, that you and I have spoken about many times is that, you know, um, you know, Northland's not the only Canadian company that is 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 uh, we're the only Canadian company doing development, uh, own operate offshore wind facilities, but there are uh, members actually within uh, MRC that uh, you know are, are deploying vessels. Uh, for the development of, of offshore wind globally, and so I, I think I think this is not, you know, we're, 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 there's a little bit of a, a kind of a Canadian local perspective that that I've been talking about here, but I, I hope I got a message across about how big the future market is, and if we can develop those capacities here in Canada, that's going to create opportunities for Canadian suppliers 
to get involved that we that we could see you know when we're doing work in asia and we're doing work in in, in the european theater to see more canadian companies uh, participating in the supply chains abroad a good point and i mean we do a lot of trade missions and we have a lot of companies that are looking for opportunities when there isn't as much domestic development but they have the skills that they can apply to global projects so i agree with you john it's it's a major opportunity and not just in canada or just in bc um i think that we are at time so yes. i won't ask another question um so i just want to thank both uh riley and john for chatting with me this morning but this afternoon for me in halifax and um thanks again to coast and david for having us. Um, and I would just mention if anybody that's attending today is interested in learning more about marine renewables um, and just kind of digging in a bit deeper, feel free to go to our website, marinerenewables.ca. Over to you, Okay, David. yes. <laughs> thank you, Elisa. And um, uh, thank you for your presentation and for leading this very interesting conversation. And uh, also to uh, John and uh, Riley, there's um, uh, your presentations were very good, and I think a lot of uh, uh, all of us learned a lot from this session. But it, one of the things I learned is how big this topic is, and uh, there's a lot more to talk about here. And um, but our our next coast talk, I want to remind people of that. It's uh, about a month from now, on September the 22nd at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Um, so please join Captain Jamie Marshall, Vice President of Business Development and Innovation with BC Ferries, as he dives into the innovation behind the new hybrid electric island class ferries. And uh, we also have another Coast Talk, uh, the one in October, October 20th, which will again go back to ocean renewable energy. So uh, I invite all of you to join that. and. Uh, questions you weren't able to ask today, there's another opportunity to do that. And you can sign up for Coast Talks on our website at canadacoast.ca and view past talks on YouTube. In the meantime, to learn more about Coast, you can also head to our this website, canadacoast.ca, to learn more about becoming a member. Right now, membership in Coast is free for a limited time and early members have an opportunity to help us build a clean tech innovation hub here on Southern Vancouver Island. So thanks again to our panelists and thanks to all of uh, you for joining us and see you next month. Pleasure, thank you very much. Thank you everyone.